Hi again, welcome into episode number five of When the Game Ends. My name is Ben Holden, upper left, my co-host Mike Carmen, and on the bottom in the middle of the screen is Will Hooley, retired rugby player, was a USA Eagle, now heavily involved in Major League Rugby here in the U.S. Will, it's uh, great to have you on the show, man. I'm looking forward to you and Carmi getting to know each other and, and you and I reacquainting. We haven't seen each other uh, since San Diego in your backyard, and we did the final back in early August. How you been, man? I've been good, man. It's been too long, hasn't it? It has. You know, those, those days when we're in the booth, I'm already looking forward to Major League Rugby 2025. But I'm good. I'm based here in sunny California in San Diego. Can't complain. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. Even though rugby is in its off-season at the moment, it's still plenty of busy projects I'm involved in with Major League Rugby. I'm sure we might touch on a few of those things later on but oh, yeah. but but ultimately overall i um yeah trying to get into some routine only a year out or just over a year out from playing and i'm sure again we'll come on to i look forward to hearing what mike has to say as well just about the transition of coming out of being an athlete into this real world as i you know try and call it so um but the good man yeah all things are good and pleased to be on the show all right well, well light years ahead of me that's for sure because you're only a year out and i'm i'm coming up on uh Actually, this year is 10 years, and I can promise you a year out, I was not doing as well as you are with uh, finding what the next path is. So we can get into all that later, but <laughs> that's good stuff, though. Yeah, well, let's kind of start right there, Will. And As you know, you and I, you know, become friends and broadcast partners over the last year. And, you know, we talked uh, last week about what we're doing. I know you've seen some of the stuff that we put out. And, and the premise of this thing is Carmi and I kind of stumbled on it one night. We were texting. We were trying to meet up. He coaches hockey in Minnesota. And one thing led to the next. And, and we both kind of fallen in love with this thing. We really like the, the concept of it. And that is when the game ends. So let's just get right to that. We're going to get into the career and, and, and what you're doing now. But, like, take us back to when you realized the game was going to be over for you and, and the game essentially ended. Yeah, I mean, maybe I might be different to a few other stories, which I'm sure you've um, you've already spoken to and, and will continue to speak to, in that my ending was one that I wanted to write. And and I, that almost sounds a little bit egotistic, doesn't it, to say it like that? But it, my sport, Rugby Union, which was ultimately, you know, something which gave me so much, but at the same time, I very much knew I had to have another career and wanted to plan that. So then I made that move. Um transition wise quite efficiently effectively and something that i wanted to get myself into you know you asked when did i know i probably wanted to get to grips with things in my mid-20s i think when covid hit um that was certainly an eye-opener for us as athletes is to to see that you really do need to think about your next career sport can be taken in a blink of an eye obviously that was accelerated by the fact of covid19 when it when it came but i think for me I enjoyed as a player having another vision, another passion alongside my playing. It made me probably perform better as a player as well. So mm. in a time actually of misfortune, I remember being injured um, with a concussion. This was actually all the way back in 2016. Mm. I already was thinking about, okay, well, while I was resting and recovering and had time on the sidelines, what, what could I do to busy myself? And, and media is something which I fell into a little bit, but also got asked, would I be interested in writing in this and, and doing a, podcasting and and the next thing you know one thing led to another it's the network you build i did a degree in sports journalism broadcast and, and, and media and that really helped me uh, and ultimately gave me the tools and then also as i say those connections to start thinking about well when i did leave the game where could i go into and that covid time was a transition period for me as well i finished my program my professional rugby in the UK, I came over to the U S and I kind of wanted to do a few years in America, play professionally minus my accent. I obviously represented the U S as well. <laughs> and, and then go into, to a field, which I was excited about, which was sports media. Um, but I would did it very proudly in my own terms. I could have, could have, could have continued to play, but at the same time, you know, had the opportunity to, to do what I'm doing now. And that's certainly in terms of an achievement of mine, it's probably one that I'm, I'm, most proud about yeah and i want to jump into i want to come back to the piece you wrote on your retirement that ben sent me that i read before this and that was really really you know interesting just just a great perspective on everything that you had come to terms with and you know leaving kind of your your final game 
Um, but I want to jump back to the COVID comment. What, so during COVID, how did that affect you with rugby? What was kind of where, you, you know, obviously for a while there, everybody was shut down. It doesn't matter what sport it was. Um, did rugby phase it back in? Did they sit out a whole year? Kind of what was your situation like? Well, I mean, definitely for us, I was based in the UK and, you know, rugby was really just sort of put a complete pause on. I'll never forget. We got that email that came through the club I was playing at. I was actually transitioning from one club to another into a, into a bigger club, which was very exciting, but it was almost like, geez, are we going to get going? Is, is rugby going to happen in the next year or so? And it, and therefore you had time, you had time to think about things. Yes. You were training in the backyard and, you know, you couldn't train together because of close contact stuff, which I'm sure was the same here in the U S. Um, but you had some time to think about, you know, different projects to do, or I created my own podcast, um, which was actually called the next game very similar to what you guys are doing. I wanted to talk to individuals about their transition, the successful ones, the ones that have been challenging um, and grow that as a media audience for myself, but also as storytelling and understanding what what is to do when you do move away from being an athlete. So it was that time, I think, that COVID gave me that ultimately propelled me, I would say, in making up my mind. Plus as well, I was getting to my later twenties and I think in the sport that we play rugby injury is a, is a naturally part of our game. I would taken some hits, I'd taken some concussions and kind of knew, right. If I can get to 30, I wanted to go to another world cup. I wanted to go and play in America, but at that point my focus would change to, okay, well then what's next? Actually it wasn't necessarily another playing contract. It was more like, can I get myself into a position to go into my next career? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's almost a blessing in disguise, the COVID situation that I feel like for you um, in, in that it gave you that time to like step away and be like, hey, I'm still in the game, but I'm going to, I'm not playing right now. So, hey, what else can I do to fill my time? What interests me? You know, what do I want to do after? And so you really got to jumpstart on it. Sounds like that way. Um, you know, one thing I, I took away from the the piece that you wrote, um, really like the, the the quote that you had, very well written, by the way, the entire piece. So <laughs> well done there. Thank you. But, um, sports can give you moments of utter euphoria. It may only last a few seconds, but can make you feel complete. And it's an unrivaled sense of peace that so few get to experience. And I really resonated with that because um, that's something that, yeah, there's other things in your life that are going to make you happy. Um, you know, getting married, starting a family, having kids. And that's not to take away from those or, or say that one is better than the other, but there's something so unique about when you, like, for example, you're the winning, Ben sent me a video clip of your winning kick against uh, Samoa with Team USA, stuff like that, where you just, there's nothing else that matters at that point in life. And that feeling of, man, that was awesome. Like the, the excitement you have from that. So I really appreciated that comment. And then I, uh, I haven't heard anybody say it like that before. No, well, I, I appreciate you, you applauding me that. And I appreciate Ben for giving me such good raps in, in terms of <laughs> introducing me. Um, oh, true. Hopefully he continues on those lines. But look, it was, yeah, I, I, I think you'll know more than anyone, Mike, like the reality of those moments. And it can be, you know, winning a championship, of course, but also just like that feeling of, in our game, scoring a trial, getting that match winner you know, getting a goal, getting a, that, that last, I mean, geez, I was watching the world series and it gave me goosebumps. I'm not even a Dodgers fan, but when Freddie Freeman hit that, that home run that just brought the house down and like, I'm even getting a little bit now. It was just like, look, I, I know the world of the military and I know Ben, you know, the world of military. I yes, know sir. it can give you that, that real sort of um, togetherness and achievement of a goal. I'm not saying that there's nothing out there that can give you that real sense of euphoria of achievement but there's something sport that i just think is so unique and i knew it would be the thing that i've missed or would miss and i do miss that like the the those feelings of complete and utter accomplishment through going through something together as well that's maybe even more of a team sport thing and i've learned and it's not a knock on <laughs> major league rugby or, or, or the real world or corporate world or whatever you want to call it but like you know, like it's not necessarily everyone's complete passion. 
sport is a life. It was my way. Like rugby was not just my sport that I enjoyed. It was my life until and still to this day, ultimately as well. And, and therefore those moments are so hard to replicate, so hard to describe unless you kind of been there yourself. And, you know, it, it did give you that peace. The other flip side of that though, Mike, which you will also know is it can also give you those lowest lows, like genuinely make you feel terrible um, through more ways than one. So that's the reality of why, why we did it. Um, and something that I do miss. Chasing that feeling for sure. I mean, that's something, again, I've never really thought about it that way, but it's something where when you don't have a plan, like in my situation, I did not have a plan for what I was going to do when I got done playing and having like chasing that feeling and wanting to have that feeling, you realize that, you know, you're probably not going to have that same feeling in the working mm -hmm. world. Like it's, it's just not something you can replicate. And that's, again, it's not a knock on anything. Like you can enjoy your career and your second, your second career. Right. And, but it's, it is not something that is easy to replicate and you chase it for a while. And it, and some of us chase it longer than others and jump around to different career paths. So it's definitely a great perspective on that. Well, so let's go back a little bit. So you, you talked about your plan and, and how all those things work. Was that simply you in your own mind or was there somebody that you had a conversation with that kind of sparked that for you? Because I would say this, Carmi, and the ones that we've done, Will's a very rare case here, I think. I mean, in that regard, and that's that's obviously a compliment, Will, because um, I think, like like Carmi said, like he had no plan. Most guys don't have a plan. So was that somebody that sparked that in you, or is that just your own mind telling you, hey, I better do this? I think, well, first and foremost, my, my parents always instilled in me the importance of, you know, getting – good education, um, doing well at school, not forceful, not at all, but like you know, the idea that there's more out there than just sport. They, they wanted me to do all kinds of sports and they wanted me to do whatever I chose to do. But at the end of the day, um, you know, grades were important and that's that embedded in me. And, and, and as I said before, there was something that I really enjoyed about having this kind of like in professional sport, you work so hard and you dedicate a lot of time and energy but sometimes that there are moments in the day in a week where you can actually just you want to switch off and one of the ways of doing that was maybe being invested in another interest so i mean i think that 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 helped me but my parents definitely instilled the, the sort of looking outside of sport to make sure you, you stay on the straight and narrow and then i would say for sure in terms of the media side of things and as you know ben i'm not just someone who's trying to get involved in broadcasting but also behind the camera whether it be in the commercial marketing side of things yeah. is um I, I mentioned about that time where when i got an injury in 2016 and i was actually doing a online course in something else it was actually in, involved in history of all things hmm. and because of that concussion i ended up basically having to stop that for a period because I couldn't just look on computer screens and whatever. And then it was from that, that I had this time, I was keen to go and be, do something, you know, be busy. And it actually was my media manager at X, the chiefs, the club that I was playing for that kind of said to me, Hey, Will, why don't you come and write something up for our match day magazine? If we get in an old pastime player, bring him in, you interview him. And that's actually the, the real kickstart as to how I found sports media. That was then approached to be like, hey, do you want to maybe do this degree, which is, you know, distance learning and involved in broadcasting. And then that got me into having to do projects for that degree and then getting involved in a podcast and then being involved in other bits and bobs around playing, whether it be TV, radio, whatever. And, and I really started to enjoy it. I think the last thing I would like to almost say in that is that I, I'm proud of my career. I wish I'd done more uh, and was and was and was good. But I was always someone as well had to not necessarily things were just put on a plate for me. And I mean, like, I wasn't exactly the person who was always the key, you know, player in the league, you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I would describe myself ultimately in the top end more maybe as a squad player. So it ended up teaching me that, you know, yeah, to fight, I had to fight for my contracts at the end of the day. Yep. And that was fine. I achieved in many aspects, but that instilled again in me that this could, it, those multiple financial deals, whatever, are not going to be there the whole time. Certainly not for me. It might be for the, those top 0.01% of the players in my sport, but 
not for me. That also instilled me to understand that I knew another career, you know, I would have to start setting my up, setting myself up for. You mentioned injuries. I mean, do you do you know how many injuries you endured in, in the decade you played professional rugby? I mean, I was talking with Carmi about it. Like, and Will, you know this, it, it, us becoming friends and, and broadcast partners. Like, I'm fortunate to have both of you on my screen now because you're both guys in my life that are great friends and I have the ultimate respect for the sports that you each played because I don't think there are any harder sports physically to play than rugby or hockey, however you want to slice it. Uh, you've heard me say that, man, all the time in a studio. But like, I mean, was it was it a was it a list this long, or was it that long of injuries that you endured playing? Well, first and foremost, I don't know how on earth I would get on on the ice rink. I think I'd be injured more <laughs> more time more times in a day than I did maybe. We have career. pads and helmets on. We have pads exactly. and helmets on. You See, don't I see that all the on. time. <laughs> no, I think no, the no, rugby. No, 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 I'm no. just going to say before Will answers, the rugby guys are more nuts because they don't wear helmets, because they don't wear pads. But, and I say this often, and Will knows this, the respect in the sport is so impressive to me. That's probably another topic or question. But uh, first, the, the kind of path we were going down there, Will. Yeah, well, the injury front. I mean, look, I I, I was unlucky on some areas, probably, and then may, maybe lucky on other areas of my body. I mean, I definitely had concussions in my career. Uh, mm -hmm. I was probably, I've been fortunate that I was in a generation that concussions were taken very seriously. Yeah. So whether that be, you know, genuine sports science, but also medical assistance help, um, you name it, from scans to time out of the game and whatever. That did play a part in my decision also to retire in that my next career, I didn't want to be someone that I couldn't use my brain or whatever because I was still having to recover. And that maybe put me in a place where I thought, if I'm going to retire at, what was it, about the age of 30, rather than try and play for another four years and maybe continue to get more injuries. Um, but no, like I no, I had a what a few surgeries. One of the most recent ones at the back end of my career was like, you know, kind of re, re, um, reconstruction to my shoulder. But one of the ones I'm really proud about I stayed away from was my knees. My knees are actually pretty good for a rugby player. I, I'm, yeah. I'm proudly saying no knife has touched my knees, which I don't think many rugby players, I don't know hockey players as well can say, but, um, yeah, look, it wasn't necessarily a long list, but just those, um, the wears and tears. And I think the concussion side of it as well. Um, for me, I loved defending, tackling. And I look back at my career and I was like, I put my head in the spokes probably stupidly and not technically in the right way as well sometimes, uh, particularly when I was, you know, in my sort of midway put through my career. And that's the thing about rugby. You could say we're not we're nutters, but at the same time, techni technical aspects of tackling are taken very seriously, and that's why player welfare is deemed, uh, you know, high regard as as much as we can in our contact sport. But yeah, look, long way of saying my injury list wasn't too bad. Well, it's it's funny you say that about like you know the technical and like you're you're putting a lot of thought into how you're hitting people, right? Because you don't have pads on. I mean, hockey is almost the exact opposite of that, where you know, you see red and you don't care which part of your body hits the guy first, you're coming full speed ahead at him. And, you know, you, you also bring up the point that, you know, being in the era when, so you and I are pretty close in age. I'm a few years older than you. I was kind of like the end of my career was kind of right around the time they started paying more attention to concussions, concussions, excuse me. Uh, but coming up like high school, college, like, you know, it's, you got your bell rung. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I get asked that question every once in a while, you know, how many concussions do you have? And I'm like, well, technically I think I have one, but that's very technically, you know, there's probably a couple other instances in there. Right. But um, you know, the, the similarity, I think that, you know, being careful about what you do is the difference from when you go to college to pro because in college you're wearing a cage, like you have no regard for your face whatsoever. You don't care or the mm -hmm. guy you're hitting yeah. their face either. But as soon as the visors come into play at pro, there's a different awareness of like your stick and where you're hitting guys and things like that. But also on the minors, there's a lot of guys that don't care and still try to rip your head off and hit, <laughs> hit your head first. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I just, I found that was kind of like a similarity of what you're talking about where you guys work on technical hitting and the transition from college to pro and hockey is when I think that phase comes around where it's like, Hey, I got to be a little more aware and not be leading with my face when I'm going into guys. I think that's a really good point. And, and I definitely say in the back end of my career, I was definitely more aware 
of um, probably just like in rugby, you can't hide. So like, you know, at the end of the day, it's a contact sport, probably very similar to hockey. Like at the end of the day, you need a bar up. But at the same time, it's like, well, I was a playmaker. So what was important that I was on the pitch, I was in the right areas. I wasn't at the bottom of the, on the ground in the bottom of a breakdown, for example, or, mm. you know, so yeah, I could have maybe played the game a little bit smarter, but I was just, you know, there was also part one part of my game that was perceived as a, as a good thing, you know, as uh, I could defend well, but look, we're going a little off piece here, but yeah, it's, uh, there's always these things. Now you look back on uh, when you look at your career and, and yeah, there's potentially injuries that maybe I could have avoided. So, Will, I gotta, I gotta backtrack a little bit. So, Carmi's got ties to your homeland. Carmi, there we go. You gotta tell the story to Will, man, and then we'll get back so, into it. So, Ben didn't have any idea about this. Um, so when we were, when I was a kid growing up, my dad we moved around a lot for his job in the states over here, and we actually spent two years in Manchester. Wow. And when I was like seven to nine <laughs> and I brought this up to him, I still have it. I don't have it here. It's somewhere in storage with my parents and whatnot, but I went to a couple St. Helens rugby games and I had a Steve Prescott Jersey. Do you know the name? Well, th you would have watched rugby league though, if you were in St. Yes. Helens. Yes. Right. Um, but um <laughs> that does ring a bell. It sounds like a bit, yeah, he's uh, pretty old. Prescott was a bit of a England rugby league legend. So there you go. That's so I still have a rugby ball signed by him and a Jersey somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> like I said, it's somewhere with my parents, but I, I kind of thought about that when Ben said we were coming on, I was like, well, you know, like I, we played rugby in school and I, I never played like on like a team competitively outside of playing at school, whatever. But I remember like being confused by the rules because I was, you know, even though I'm, you know, young kid, as like I know what football is, like American football. And so, you know, just different things that, you know, you can't do like for, you know, rugby, for example, you guys have to touch the ball to the ground to score, correct? Like you have correct. to have possession of it. And that's why they slide into the to the end zone. I, I, you guys probably call it something else. But Fizer. I just remember like the I remember the first time we were playing in gym and I went in and spiked the ball. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. That, yeah, no, you, I, got, yeah. I got absolutely called out for that one <laughs> yeah that that would never work in our game it's uh yeah the the gronkowski sort of uh gronk slam whatever you call it um would actually be possession turned over and you'd be laughed at and by your teammates probably be very angry at you as well yeah. oh yeah that'd be that's probably the equivalent in football over here of the guy who five yards out drags the ball behind him showing off and then the guy comes out and swats it away and he fumbles it it's probably pretty, pretty equivalent much. to that Will will, <laughs> will will appreciate this. American football does not exist without the sport of rugby. It doesn't exist without rugby. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize that, but it's true. It really is. Um, last part of this, I want to get into a little bit more of what you're, what you're doing now, but I do want to shift gears here for a couple minutes and, and get your, I mean, you and I talk, we talked all the time, even weeks we didn't do matches together last year. We became so close and good friends that we talk no matter what. So looking back on the first year, how much did you, like, was it hard for you doing games mentally and letting go of not being a player? Instead, now I'm watching guys I just played with five months ago and I'm commentating on their games. What was that like for you, Will, this first year as a commentator? That Great question. And I'm almost going to give a disappointing answer. It was uh, totally no, you fun. can't. No, no, no. But I, but then I will almost you know say the opposite side in that it was actually great. And the reason being, I think one because we do a lot of commentary remote, so we're not actually there at the stadium. But when we have been there at the stadium, as you oh. know, Ben, that feeling of the atmosphere, Mike, what we talked about earlier, that sense of euphoria, or just those feelings of gearing up to a game, walking out the tunnel in front of thousands of people then you when you when you're part of that on the commentary side and you're seeing your mates former teammates whatever it might be doing that you're like oh yeah I, I i do miss that but then at the same time i think it goes back maybe if you ask me this question i'm probably almost a year or two whereby we did this interview again it may be there might be some different answers gotcha i I, I, it was quite quick, very quick. I went from one career into the other, right? As yeah. we've already discussed, I planned it and it worked out. Yep. But I think the reason 
that therefore didn't make me miss it as much as because I knew that I was doing the thing I wanted to do and achieved it. And I got into the booth and it was like my next career. And actually I was thinking about, right, you know, how can I be the best at that and and be a better broadcaster, announcer, an analyst, whatever it might be. And, and I was really focused on that direction rather than sitting there going, oh God, I'm here. I really feel like I should be there. No, like I actually was in the position that I wanted to be in. Um, albeit, as I say, on the game side of things was was, was maybe when I'm actually there in the stadium. Well, there was a few things like before the game, which were a bit like, oh. And then when you, you, although when you're in the stadium, you hear the hits going in, I'm like, no way, I am done. My shoulders could not cope with that anymore. Um, so that that's almost, you know, been uh, counter whatever to myself, whatever I just said. But look, I think though, the reality of what I do miss, and I think though, I enjoyed as a broadcast team. We were a team. It does go back to though what I absolutely find I kind of miss about being the athlete is that team environment, the communication and the the trustworthiness and the the drive of going after something as a team. I, I'm not trying to avoid your question here because as I say, the reality is I didn't really miss playing, but I do miss the environment. And that is something where and now a year on, I'm I'm like, oh boy, like. Where, where's the recipe to to get that back and the reality is like there isn't really one um because it is not, not unfortunately the same as being in that locker room uh with the boys locker room feeling i think that resonate that resonates in any sport um you know it's it's something that i think almost to a fault if you ask the guys what they miss the most when they're done playing like again we talked about your comment about the euphoria of the the moments that you can feel but that locker room feeling on a daily basis losing that that's really hard. That that's mm. something like you said, going to battle with guys. And especially when you have a great team, close team, everybody hangs out together. And I was fortunate that most of the teams I played on were like that. Um, you know, you just, you look forward to that every single day and then losing that is, is a big, uh, it's a big change. Um, I want to jump back to what you said about, you know, we we're talking about the switch to broadcasting so quickly. Did you have a hard time maybe commenting negatively on guys you knew mm or players you played against that you had respect for? Was that, was that a tough, uh, Justin? Yeah, great question. Um, yes, I think, I think it was almost like, again, because I was so fresh out, the last thing I wanted to do is forgive my language. It kind of like shit on people, you know, because I know how hard it is the game that rugby is. And I've been there and it hasn't always gone so well. And I've made those probably exact mistakes that I'm then calling out or having to try and call out on broadcast. However, there has to be a place whereby if I'm going to do this job properly as an uh, as an analyst, you have to, and I know, and I think I'll be better. And I'm telling Ben, I think I'm going to be better in year two, just being like a year out, just being a bit more brutally honest on things because that's what people want to hear. They don't want to hear, you know, uh, someone just say, or sit on the fence. Yeah. And just sort of say, oh, yeah, oh, it was a shame and things like that. It's like, no, why, why was it not good? And why, you know, was it a good decision or not a good decision? And actually in the end that could cost their team or that player is not in form at the moment. But I think one of the other things as well, though, good broadcasters have good relationships. Uh, the ones that certainly I know, I think there's probably the other side where like people are just got this complete opinion and they're very good pundits and i think people enjoy that but then i also think there are elements of people who are well connected still to the game you know the reality is is for me to be a good analyst in rugby i still need to know what's going on you know i'm a year out now things are going to change the game's going to change a little bit the tactics might change a little bit and if i'm not connected with the game if i can't go into a rugby franchise and go literally into the building and ask some questions because I'm not allowed anymore, you know, because someone's got annoyed me and they don't want to invite me back or whatever it might be, then um, then that then that's going to be a problem for, for me as well. So it's a fine line. I'm definitely learning it. And, and to what you said, yeah, it's difficult, De definitely difficult at times. Trust me, Carmi, you're going to be watching rugby next year. I'm telling you, you will. You You watch one match, you'll be addicted to it. It's You'll love it. It's physical. It's right up your alley. That's the kind of player Carmi was, Will. He was physical, did a lot of different things. But one thing he was really good at was being a physical player. So um, that's good he's stuff. A grinder. By the time Ben met me, I was a grinder, as they call it, Will. I was I was a check and run <laughs> guy, and I spent a lot of time in the corners and uh, going to the areas, you, you know, that you 
not everybody wants to be in all the time, but that was kind of, that's how I had to make my living. And you actually brought it up earlier too. And something I resonated with, like, you know, if someone looked at my career on paper, um, I had, I was fortunate to get to do a lot of cool things like you. I got to go do international events. Um, I got to be a part of the U S program in high school out here and, and then come back home to Minnesota and play for the university of Minnesota, which if you grow up here, it is, a, it is a dream to play for this school. Yeah. Um, so I got to do all this stuff like, and, and right. And then you get drafted in the NHL, all these things. But the reality of it was when I got to pro, I felt like my job was on the line every single day. I was not mm-hmm. in a position where I felt like I had a, I knew I had a contract coming. Um, it was always like, I always felt like I had to try and prove myself. And if I took a day off or like, you know, and, and, part of that is too, you play through some things that you probably shouldn't um, because you're like, I'm not taking myself out. Cause I will, if I take myself out, it's opening up a spot for someone else. So all of those things like having to grind and work for it. Um, but again, you took it one step further and realized, okay, it isn't guaranteed. What do I have coming next? And you know, that's definitely, that's a, that's a testament to you. So that's, that's very impressive. You were able to do that. So, well, let's shift gears again here. And one of the things that you've been involved with for quite some time, at least the time I've known, you know, I believe beyond that um, is loose heads. It's something that deals with mental health and and mental fitness and all those things. And, you know, kind of like you guys were talking about earlier, there was a time when none of that seemed to matter. It was kind of like concussions where it was kind of like you swept it under the rug, but now it's, it's almost a routine thing. And especially with, what we're doing on this podcast, I, I remember saying to Danny DeKaiser, guy that made $50 million in the NHL, I, I said, that I think the misconception is with pro athletes, when they retire, they're supposed to be okay and everything's good and nothing's supposed to bother them. But the mental part is what I'm finding with you guys that are former athletes is the hardest thing. Tell us what you do with loose heads and how important that is to you, Will. Well, I mean, Lucids is is a uh, charitable organization that spreads awareness of mental health. Um, hashtag tackle the stigma that surrounds mental health in rugby. And they do that by spreading the message, by engaging with rugby clubs, getting ambassadors on board to make rugby a safe space as guys. Yeah. And then also within the women's game as well to be that kind of clubhouse of, you know, it's OK to not be OK and and talk about your feelings and, and know that, as I say, I use that word um or that expression safe place. Um, and equally on that, they're working hard and, and at Major League Rugby with the connection and partnership we've got with Lou says are working hard to therefore bring in resources for athletes as well. Um, those who are having mental health challenges, because it's interesting you make the point about the retired rugby players or athletes in general is, yeah. I mean, start with the obvious, you lose a complete sense of purpose yeah, because you literally had an identity, a purpose and, a lot of the time, and, and and I look back at it now, and it was wrong because I'm I I wasn't just a rugby player. I was a person. I was I'm a husband. I'm a I'm a you know a, a brother and whatever it might be. But like you, it kind of went to go and meet someone, and you'd be like, "Hi, I'm Will Hooley. I, I I'm I'm a professional rugby player," or something like that as your sort of identity, right? Which is right. just as soon as that goes, you know. That, what, what have you left with and and as we've discussed a lot of people have, have not got those plans and are left with nothing and i think mentally can really take a hit on, on someone uh, and you see that a lot in, in in our sport and i think rugby as well being that contact element bravado uh, masculinity testosterone all those things like you don't want to show weakness and that unfortunately has been the issue, I think, in, in in years gone by, and we're doing better, and it's something that we are trying to tackle, and something I'm very proud to be part of. Uh, personal links to that organization as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, but some good work that that's gone into it as well. It's awesome. Yeah, it's you know you make that point about the you identify as that, and I, I think it'd be rare to find a guy that doesn't identify like that because for for an athlete because you you get put on a pedestal, whether you want to or not, it's not a matter of ego or like, I'm better than you as a person um, to, you know, when you meet someone, but you, you are put at that, you know, whatever level of celebrity status, you, if you want to call it that, where that's, Hey, this is who I am. This is what people know me for. Mm-hmm. And it's, that goes away. And it's like, like you said, it's not right to think that way, but we all did for the most part, like what, who am I now? 
Like, who are people going to think you think people like you almost feel embarrassed to talk to people because, you know, you're kind of like, I don't you know. This is who I was and I'm not that anymore. And I didn't have, again, like my career figured out at that time, um, t- trying to have that conversation um, and like, well, who am I? And you like kind of shy away from it almost like you should be embarrassed about it or disappointed or whatever. And you shouldn't be. No, and I, I think just to add to that, Mike, as well, is a lot of people, therefore, are embarrassed to ask for, for help. And, you know, I think in the end, kind of that's also the problem with with sport, particularly guys. We're so proud and therefore it's kind of like, well, I'm going to figure this out. You know, I'll be all right. And, and some people bot- bottle it up. Some people are different. Some people like to, you know, I probably I, I like to share my thoughts. I like, you know, it might be me and Ben it might be an issue that I might be having at work or something like that. And sometimes it's just nice just to talk it out with someone, but not everyone is like that. So in the end, um, yeah, I would say with athletes, you always, you know, thinking maybe, you know, best or whatever, and you don't actually ask for the help that you need. Yeah. I've told my son for a few years, he's, you know, I'm sure he's fine me bringing this up and will, I think I might've talked with you about it. You know, he's had some struggles with stuff and I've said for years, I'm like, I would not want to be a high school student now in this day and age. And, and I've always told my son, and I believe in this myself, because like all of us, we all have our own story. We have all gone through certain struggles in our lives. It takes courage and strength to ask for help. And like like you said, Will, and, and I think that's something to be proud of. I think it's, you know, help yourself. Don't let it get worse. And I know that's, you know, a lot of what you guys do. And I've seen some of the clips you've done with with the interviews with some of the players you've talked to. And it's it's great to see it encourages and inspires me. Well, I think it, just again, just an additional bit to this as well is as an athlete in my game, if I wanted to improve my kicking, I go work at it. And actually what I might also do is go and seek a kicking coach. It might right. be in the game of hockey, forgive me for my very amateur understanding of the game, but if you wanted to improve your shooting, you know, at the end of the day, you go and work on it and you go and go and seek advice from professionals or peers or coaches well, this is the thing with your mental health, like it's there, like it's there to be worked on. It's obviously not visible, but then in doing that, it's okay to, to ask for help to also not lean on teammates. You don't want to be an overburden, but if you have a safe environment whereby, you know, you can have people around you who are, you can talk to about some issues and whatever it might be. Um, it ends up just being, I think, so much better, the environment that you build yourself in and then the environment that you're in, whether you work a team or whatever it might be. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is great. We're talking about this because I, I don't know if I, when Ben and I first talked about the idea of this podcast, I don't know if I fully understood how much mental health was going to creep in, but I mean, it's going to creep in every single episode because it's such a big part of this, yeah. but it's also, you know, some of the people I've talked to outside of this, they've seen that we're doing this and they, you know, they, they've talked about, they like the idea and it, but it resonates beyond sport too for people um like you can listen to this and you don't have to be a former professional athlete like you don't have to have you know played a sport at a high level whatever you any sort of life transition you're going through starting over career you get fired um you know you lose, lose a loved one and you're you know starting over like whatever it is i mean so much of this carries over beyond sport what we're talking about and i think that's really cool and that's that's um like i said really impressive you're involved with truly putting that focus on that mental health So, Will, if you could talk to a young player, this is something we we made a staple of the of the podcast. And I'm not letting you off the hook yet because I got a few rugby questions in closing. Once Carmi tells me he's good and we're good with the interview, I got a couple too rugby specific ones. So, oh, right here we it. go. This will be good. Quite, so let's let's do the business here first. So, yeah. You, your, your plan is, is incredible, man. Like getting to know you and now sharing it with Carmi and I and, and sharing it for other people that'll see this, um, a plus job, man, on preparing yourself, man. It's so awesome to see and awesome to work with you and see what you're doing when we're not working together. Question is the best advice you can give to a young, whether it's a rugby player or just an athlete in any sport, what's the best advice you can give them about preparing and being ready for when the game ends. Find something you like. And the difference what I say is find something you love to be with find something you like. Really, I, I, I've been asked this before. And there's a reason I say that is because 
when you're playing and you do think about your next career, you're not naturally going to think, well, I, I just want to so want to be a banker or I really want to be involved in, you know, getting involved in space science or something like that. Maybe you do. Maybe you are destined that you really want to just be a lawyer or whatever it might be. And that's fantastic. Those are the best people who then go and transition. But just find something you like. Is it like, do you enjoy going to, you know, post-match after a game and enjoy connecting with fans or sponsors? And that could lead you to communications. That could lead you to being part of commercial, event management, whatever it might be. And amongst all those things about what you like, and it could be anything as well to being like, project management, uh, property, whatever it is, then use your network. And I, I'm probably more talking to the professional athletes out there is like you are, when you're an athlete, you have such, people want to be around you. I think you mentioned this earlier, Mike, people want to yeah. be around you. And I never forget when I was 20 years old, a uh, teammate of mine who was a back end of his career. And funny enough, he now is the head coach of the team that I play for Northampton Saints guy called Phil Dowson. And he said to me, he said, Will, like, go to the golf events, go to the the boxes at the end of the game and go and network because of the your current and your popular as it is now. When you finish, the reality is your popularity will go. And the next kid will be on the block. Yeah. So at this point, use that. So that's why I say find what you like, because then you can get into avenues and then use your network because there'll be network out there who are involved in media or property or consulting or whatever it might be. And then from that, you don't have to necessarily be like, okay, right. I have to get this roll down perfectly, but you can get yourself into an area. I wanted to get into sports media. Did I really know whether I wanted to get into broadcasting? Did I really know whether I wanted to go and get involved in media commercial partnerships? No, but I then, at least with that, I knew that I could get in involved in a whole area of stuff that then I could branch off into understanding, okay, I like that, or maybe I don't like that. Like, I'll be honest, marketing is actually different to maybe what I thought it was going to be. Meanwhile, media partnerships and whatever is actually really interesting. But all oh, that bit about media law, eh, it's a bit, you know. So that's what I'm trying to say. Find things that you like and put effort into then using your network to explore more about that. A great point. The like versus love thing. Cause like you said, you're most people aren't going to know like, Hey, I'm obsessed with this and I want to go into that. So I really like that. That's, that's a great way of putting it. I think as, but yeah. And because as well, just particularly on the athlete front is that love that you were when you were a kid wanting to be that professional hockey player or professional rugby player. Like, I don't know. I don't know how many people grew up, in their, as a kid wanting to be a professional head of chief of marketing for a organization. I don't know. Maybe, maybe some people did. So like, that's what I mean. I like, don't kid yourself into being like, oh, I've got to find something like really passionate and whatever. It's like, you might have that, which is brilliant. Don't worry about that. You will explore it, but just get yourself at least into things that you like. And then that will help you. Um, cause I see, I see guys and girls always being like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. It's like, oh fire. Like, what do you like doing? And then from there, you, there are so many jobs and careers out there that you don't know probably a lot about, but you at least start with what you like. You then can explore that as I say, through your network. I've been taking it one step further. It's like almost say yes to everything that you get invited to do. Right. Like oh. whether it's, you know, while you're playing or right after you get done, like don't shy away. Even if it's something you're like, yeah. I don't know if I really want to do that. It's like anytime you have the opportunity to be around people, like you said, networking, um, experiencing and finding out what's out there because you don't know everything that's out there. That's, you know, that's definitely a big thing that I remember being told to like say yes to everything. I tell that to young broadcasters all the time, man. Never say no. Do whatever you can do. You'll Like Will said, you'll figure it out. You'll weed out what you like and what you don't like. So um carmy business wise are we cool can we have a little fun here with five minutes of uh will's time just on some rugby stuff i think so all right I so, so i i gotta mention this i know will is incredibly proud of this carmy there's a I, they should do this in hockey i mean you go you guys both played internationally mike played for the world junior teams for the the under 20 teams in hockey for two tournaments right carmy and, and, of course, Will was an eagle for the United States. Eagle 517, right, Will? Correct. Well done. 
Yes. And uh, that's what happens when we do 40 games together a year. Um, <laughs> explain, explain to us. I know, but I want you to explain to the audience and, and to Mike how a guy from the UK, as you said, with that accent, plays for the American squad. And I know that is something you are incredibly proud of in your career, all the years you played, man. Yeah, no, I am. It's 100% the proudest achievement of my career. And, and and I do feel very connected to this country as well. I mean, this is why my wife and I, my wife's English as well. We live here now, but um, no, it's really through my grandmother. She's born and raised in Los Angeles. And, and when I was to cut a very long story short, I was playing top end rugby, professional rugby in the premiership. And, and funny enough, my dad sat next to this American couple asking questions, talking, obviously it was his mom, my grandmother, who was the, the sort of born and raised in LA. And by the end of the game, they, this, this, the man from the couple just turned around to her dad. He's like, well, well, who are you here? Who are you watching? Whatever. And I think I had a pretty good, good game that day. And, and that person was on the board of directors for USA rugby. And the next thing was kind of like, he said to my dad, be like, well, your son can qualify for America. He obviously you heard about that. My dad's mom was technically American and, Long story short, yeah, that there was emails from eight my them to my agent, and then I was th- considering like, okay, what's the the right move for me? And you know, if I go away from being a, an English player or was on the qualification of English player, does that do something wrong to my career domestically in the UK? Anyway, I then made decision. I remember it was back end of 2017. I made my first game in 2018, and it was the best thing I ever did. Traveled the world met incredible people played in the biggest and best tournaments in front of the most amazing crowds. And really all thanks to one, my grandmother and two, that infamous day when my dad sat next to this American couple. Awesome. Crazy. That's how that happened. That's funny. Um, so I, I'm curious, did you get any backlash? You know, I know you kind of alluded to like, you know, worried about like how it would affect your career in England, but did you get any backlash from any random media people or anything over there? Like, oh, this guy's being a deserter to go play for the Americans or anything like that? No, not massively. But then I did. I never forget. I um, it was either in an interview or an article that I wrote. And uh, this is really back end of my career, maybe like last year or two of my career. And and I basically said uh, and I wrote how rugby needs to be Americanized and there's a lot what I mean in that, just in terms of how it's presented, halftime show, whatever it might be. But um, but then this thing got out, whatever, and, and I, there were so many comments, plenty of good ones in agreement, but also comments that were coming at me basically saying, like, you don't know what Americanization is like. Those NFL players are drug seekers and whatever. All these, like, I was like, mm. whoa. And basically saying, like, get back on a boat, go back to your home country and stop trying to you know, say what's right about rugby in this country or something like that. Yeah. No, that that was one time that I just that that just drifted away and it was probably only a handful or so people. And the one thing you realize with the media, Ben and I talked about this. You're always gonna get well, I'm talking about as a player, you're always gonna get judged. Even in the media, you're you're always gonna have someone. There is no doubt people sitting in America going, we don't need to listen to this English accent. You know what I mean? I'm sure. But like, so long as on the whole, a majority, my bosses are happy. <laughs> they were all sweet. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, that leads me into my final question I get for that. I have comparing, you know, I would assume the level on um, the depth of the league in England is stronger than the U S. Um, but how, how did it compare when you, when, you know, from you're playing in England, the next year you're playing in the U S like how do, how do the games compare for you? Yeah. I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I obviously knew quite a bit about Major League Rugby before I came over. I've been playing with guys for the US. Um, so, um, but I think with the English rugby, uh, it, it is incredibly competitive. Salaries are bigger there at the moment. It's been there, obviously, as, as a competition for much longer. Rugby in Europe is a bigger sport. Um, and yeah, it's it, it's tough. You play more games. You play for longer periods of time in the year. And and not helped also by the weather. One reason I wanted to come to San Diego is because I wanted to get to some sunshine. Um, <laughs> but like th- the way that things are developing here in the US, the competition, uh, the style of play is definitely getting faster and, and more physical. I would say 
naturally the premiership and rugby in Europe is just that big, bigger and better and stronger. But the US and the MLR is certainly closing that gap. And I think you're really seeing that probably because the domestic of the US talent is getting better. It's not just these guys signed from overseas to come into the league. It's the actual influx of core development of US rugby players is much better in this country now. And Karma, you'll appreciate this. There's a there's a side, we call them sides in rugby. And I had to learn to speak the language myself. But there's a side in rugby that is basically like you played in, the program, as they call it, the National Development Program. So they have the majority of that team is now all young American players that, to Will's point, they're hoping are the next wave of players that are developed by our country. So it's kind of cool that they're kind of, I guess, taking a little piece from hockey in it, so to speak, in that way. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I, cause again, I don't, we don't have a team out here in Minnesota and I, I certainly haven't followed along with rugby um, very much, but I, you know, I do see it more and more popping up and um, I like Ben said, I'll have to, I'll have to tune in now and I can, uh, I can listen to you two goofballs talk. <laughs> yes. And, and we didn't bring this up, but we'll close with this and get a closing thought from Will. Um, there is a fellow Minnesota Golden Gopher that you played with, Will. Um, you know who I'm talking about, right? Or not? If it's Minnesota, there's only one name that really comes in my book, and that's Nate Orsberg. Bang, there it is. <laughs> yeah, he, ben brought that he, name. Ben brought that name up to me, and I was racking my brain. I was like, I don't recognize the name. I looked up his photo. I don't recognize the photo. <laughs> but I do remember that. So, we, again, we have a very, very big campus. So there's there's different areas of different <laughs> sports teams train. Not everybody's training out of the same gym. But our hockey rink had one. And, like, basketball would train there. The golf team would train there. Um, a couple of the random sports. But, anyways, I remember there being a rugby player who was training in there in the summers with us. Big dude. Um, and I don't know him. He might have been doing like a sports science internship type thing too. But I do remember there being a rugby player around from time to time. And it I'm curious if it was the same guy. I wish I wish I could remember the face. If it was a big dude, then I'm not sure it was Nate. Love Nate to bits, but he doesn't, he's um height-wise, not the tallest. Uh let's leave uh -huh. it there. But um, but no, he, he's a he's a brilliant player. And talk about domestic talent, he's led the way. He's he's what a lot of American young rugby players are trying to aspire to be like because he did it all here in this country and he's one of the best to wear the shirt for the Eagles, that's for sure. Yeah, he's an awesome player. That can be your guy, man. You can you can root for Nate and you can root for the Chicago Hans. They're one of the best sides in the league. They had a really there good run go. last year. It's close to home. That's why Nate ended up going there because he's you know as close as he can get to Minneapolis. So uh, we're gonna get him there. Well, we're gonna get him there, man. I'm telling you. So give me some gear. I'll wear it around and, and uh, be, get people yeah, asking questions about it <laughs> <laughs> on it. So will in closing, uh, tell everybody out there all the things you're working on now and uh, where they can catch you. And I know you got a lot going on. So we want to give you that opportunity before we close out. Well, yeah, I'm, I, I'm now very much working at major league rugby um, within well, I'm Jack of all trades, master of not one yet <laughs> uh, or certainly none. But um, yeah, obviously you and I, Ben, are part of the broadcasting team, thoroughly enjoy that in season um, and then involved in various other media uh, projects as well uh, that are involved with the Rugby Network, which is our network for rugby in this country, um, whether that's weekly show, the Rugby Rundown, which comes back in November, excited to bring that back. Uh, but then equally, you know, behind things as well, whether it's some content management and um, some marketing and, co and commercial um, campaigns. So, uh, yeah, a lot, lots going on, uh, put it that way. And uh, as I build my career, the, uh, this career that I only sort of properly started a year ago, I can't believe it's been a year. It feels weirdly like a long time, but also like, wow, like that feels like it's just gone in a flash since my last game of rugby. Yeah. All right. Let's go for it. Yeah. Well, Will, thanks, man. We appreciate this. Uh, great insight, great perspective from you and awesome conversation. Uh, not surprised there one bit, man. So for Will Hooley, Mike Carmen, Ben Holden saying thanks for watching. This has been episode number five of When the Game Ends. I do want to give Carmi a shout out because he designed a sweet logo for us. We now have a Twitter page and an Instagram page, When the Game Ends. So go follow us on there. We got a lot more to come. So we'll keep building. Hope you keep enjoying our shows. We'll see you next time.